from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm Robert Newland from the Law Library. It is with great honor that we welcome former U.S. Representative Patricia Schroeder to join us today for an interview with the Deputy Librarian of Congress, Robert Dyser, Jr. Before we uh, begin the program, I would like to thank uh, Bill Burton, founder of the Burton Foundation, for his generous support for making this uh, program possible today. Additionally, I'd like to recognize Professor Ryan uh, Musgrave, Director of the Rollins College Honors Program and Chair of the Department of Philosophy and Religion. Uh, Professor Musgrave and um, Congresswoman Schroeder co-teach in equity issues in U.S. legislation at Rollins College. Ryan, where do I see you? There you are. Thank you. It's very fitting that um, Bob Dysart is here today to interview Congresswoman Schroeder about her many accomplishments, most especially her years on Capitol Hill. Prior to joining the library, Mr. Dysart served for eight years as Chief of Staff uh, to his hometown Congressman, uh, Guy V. Molinari of New York. Uh, Mr. Dysart was appointed Deputy Librarian of Congress on June 17, 2012, coming up for an anniversary. Uh, after serving in a number of leadership positions in the library, including Chief of Staff, uh, Mr. Dysart will now introduce Congresswoman Schroeder. Okay, good afternoon everybody. And I uh, also want to welcome Ms. Schroeder back to the old neighborhood. Um, thank you, thank you. Where she, I, what I'm, I'm going to do is uh, I th hopefully by the, um, in the course of our discussion, you'll know a lot more about uh, former Congresswoman Schroeder and her career here, particularly on the Hill. I, I think, um, when I was, Talking to people about this event, I came across quite a few people of all ages who um, did not need an introduction to Pat Schroeder, so, uh, which is really great to hear. So I'm going to start off. We don't have a, um, nearly enough time to go through the whole career, but I, I, I told Pat I'd like to focus on her um, years in the House. When you were first elected in 1972 um, to the House, you had, you had not spent years, prior years, as a state legislator or a, a city legislator, city official, and at 32, you were the second youngest woman ever elected to the House of Representatives. Um, we're all shaped in some part by our childhood and early adult years, but when you entered the national legislative arena, uh, those early years were not that far behind you. Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I, I'd like to start with a brief overview of the years before you started to study at the University of Minnesota. And uh, you said both your parents were, and I'll quote, full of spunk with a sense of adventure and a willingness to take risks. Um, what were your pre-college years like, your growing up years? Well, I was born in Portland, Oregon, and I probably would have lived and died in Portland, Oregon, but for World War II. My father had an airport uh, a private airport on something called Swan Island. It's now an industrial park or something. But anyway, um, when, when uh, Pearl Harbor happened, uh, the government nationalized the airport and called him up to teach flying in the then Army Air Corps. So we were moved to Dallas. We were moved to um, all over. We were moved to Kansas City first and then Dallas. So when the war was over, we were in Dallas. And my dad decided to go into aviation insurance instead of running an airport because now they were going to be municipal from that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, first of all, uh, there was never a federal form long enough to fill out all the places that I lived <laughs> because yeah, yeah, of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad went to work in Ohio uh, in an aviation insurance company, and then he decided to start his own in Iowa. 
So uh, I graduated from high school in Iowa, uh, and I had gotten a, a pilot's license because the family always flew, and he felt everybody should know how. And I ended up going to the University of Minnesota because my father felt the most important thing about my going to college was <laughs> my paying my own tuition. I didn't quite agree with that, but he did. So I was busy trying to figure out how I could make enough money to get through right, school. Right. Well, the University of Minnesota at that time, um, in the wonderful Nordic, Nordic fairness thing that they had, said, well, we have these champion aircraft. They're for men only because of the ROTC, but the government doesn't say we can't rent them to you. Mm -hmm. So I got a job adjusting aviation losses for an insurance company <laughs> in Minneapolis, and that's how I worked my way through college. college. Mm -hmm. And then I went on to uh, uh, Harvard Law School okay. because I had no idea what I wanted to be. Okay, uh, oh, I could, okay. I could, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just go back a little bit, a, a little bit more to your, um, your childhood. You mentioned that you were a pilot at a very young age, 15, mm -hmm. 16? 15. Um, and could you uh, just describe, you had a, a bit of an adventure on your first solo landing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um. Oh, man. Sometimes I'm not as observant as I should be. I had a very large uh, <laughs> instructor. So when it was time to solo and he got out, <laughs> yeah. uh, I started coming around, and I was always way above the airport when it <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly realized, oh, I don't have as much weight. <laughs> I bring yeah. this thing in lower. No, I, I learned a lot of things very fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you, one of your um, notable, I, I don't want to say trademarks, but uh, it involves your signature, where you right. put, maybe this was a precursor to emoticons, but you put a happy face in the P of Pat. Um, right. That, that came from your early years. In Dallas, yeah. Texas. I started first grade, and there were five Patricias in my class. <laughs> and so the teacher said, okay, line up. You're going to be Pat, you're going to be Patty, you're going to be uh, Patsy, okay. you're going to be... And I ended up being the Patsy. And I said, somehow I don't feel like a Patsy. Could I... <laughs> put a face in the P, and that would distinguish me, you know, I, I really feel that I want to be a Pat. And so, luckily, she said yes. Right. So, it stayed with me. It drove people crazy yeah. when I was in Congress. When will she grow up? Right, right. Why does she do this? <laughs> this is terrible. So, you, you, know. you would put the two eyes and a... And a little smiling this face. This little file yeah. in, the, yeah. in the P, yeah. yeah. Okay. Blame my first grade teacher, wherever she is. Okay. <laughs> Then, and uh, also at, at Minnesota, you, you, was it at Minnesota where you learned, you studied Chinese? Yes, I and, did. And, uh, oh, but, but you credited that as a confidence builder, basically saying. It was. Yeah. And I, I, unfortunately, the class was usually early in the morning, and we even had to do the, the characters. Mm -hmm. And we had an egg in here with the brush to hold your hand properly. And I was always breaking my egg and running my sleeve yeah. through it. So I, I think I went through college with dried egg. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and now we get to Harvard Law School. You've said that I had an absolutely miserable time at Harvard. Um, why was that? Well, I had gone to Minnesota where I flew airplanes. And, mm -hmm. you know, Minnesota had this theory of, look, you're here, you're an adult. You either come or you don't. And if you don't, you fail, and that's it. So, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I showed up the first day at Harvard, and they said, you have a signed sheet. And I had young men on either side of me, and they said, we have never sat next to a girl in our entire education, and we're having our seats changed. And I thought, really? I mean, <laughs> most of the young men in my class then had gone to sex-segraded education mm -hmm. their entire life. And, you know, being in this wonderful library reminds me, I remember going to the Harvard Law Library to do some work. And a couple of these guys came over and said, do you realize you're sitting in the most important law library in America and you are taking a position from a man? And I'm like, yeah, okay, so get over it. You know, I mean, what, <laughs> what am I supposed to do about that? But there was this yeah. real, you know, 
we're here and we can't believe you're here messing it up. It was like the estrogen that I brought to the room was going to cause them right. all to, I don't know what. Right. <laughs> now, and you met your husband, Jim, at Harvard. He was I at Harvard did. Law School, too. And I should note, in, in a library. Absolutely. Um, now, I know, I know. I spent a lot of time in the library, yeah. yeah. I know each of you has written uh, memoirs of your congressional years. And uh, looking at both of those, I just wanted to get a clarification on th that particular experience. Because Jim Schroeder described the meeting as this way. One Thursday evening in late October or early November, I was studying at Langdale Library when Pat walked in. She stopped by the table where I was working, apparently looking for a particular law volume that was in the stacks. He, she smiled, and I asked her if I could be of assistance. Yes, she said. Could you please get a volume down from the top shelf? I, of course, did. We chatted quietly for a few minutes, and then I suggested we go out for dinner Saturday. She said, great, and we were set for our first date. In the Congresswoman's memoir, <laughs> it was the only bright part of law school was Jim, who came up to me one day in the frigid library and introduced himself. <laughs> so I wanted in, in the National Library here, I wanted to give I, I, I wanted to give up. the former uh -huh. Congresswoman a chance, as they say in the House, to revise and extend yeah. uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the remarks. It's the only kind of uh, uh, dif different outlook that I saw between the yeah. two of you. Uh, see, I always said to him, he had been in the Navy for three years mm -hmm. and he went to Princeton. Right. And so I think it's my way because I kept saying, you couldn't manage co-ed right. Harvard. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. were a whole 15 women yeah, in yeah, the place. Yeah, yeah. Imagine. Okay. And so I think he approached me. Okay, okay, yeah. got it. Okay. <laughs> the dispute continues. Then. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. And so after law school, you and Jim moved to Denver. How did you get to Denver, and what, what initial jobs did you have there? Well, um, we sat down and <laughs> tried to decide where we were going to live. You know how that goes? Jim was from Chicago. And I said, I've, you know, I spent winters in Minneapolis, and I don't think I want to spend winters in Chicago, too. So I want something warmer. Um, we looked at the East Coast, and we said, oh, that looked fairly stuffy. And we kept interviewing um, offices that said, well, we'd probably have to take both of you. And we thought, we really don't want to be the Bobsy twins, mm -hmm. you know, uh, working like that. So that became a problem. So finally we said, ah, Denver's a good compromise. You know, it's wonderful. It isn't quite as cold as some of the other places, and it's outdoor, and it's young people, and why not? Mm -hmm. So we did. Good, good. Okay. And so you uh, worked for the National Labor Relations Authority? I You're, did. I worked yeah. for the NLRB, right. and NLRB he went board, to work yeah. in a law firm. In a law firm, right. Okay. Again, for the same reason, that we, you know, the law yeah. firms all said either together or we, you know, we'll have conflicts. Right. And so um, then I thought, well, I'll go to work for the IRS because my specialty had been tax law. And uh, they said, well, the closest you can live to your husband is Albuquerque. And I thought, well, that's Ooh. not going to work oh, too okay. well. Okay. So okay. <laughs> I ended up at the National Labor Relations Board. Now, in, in 1970, your husband ran for a state legislative seat, Did. lost by very narrowly 42 Sliver. votes. Right. Um, but you, you were not necessarily active politically, but in... 1972, your husband was part of a group that was trying to get a candidate to um, run against uh, Republican Congressman Mike McKevick, who I, had, was a freshman and had unseated a longtime, maybe 20-year incumbent, um, Byron Rogers, in 1970. How did your name come up for that race? Oh, my. Well, we had a two-year-old and a six-year-old. Um, and I had lovely part-time jobs that was wonderful. I was doing um, hearing, I was a hearing officer for the state of Colorado in labor cases, and also I was teaching part-time at the university. So that was all fine, and I'm perfectly happy with my life. He's on this committee looking for someone to run. Now, the incumbent, they had just gone through reapportionment and redrawn the district so it would be even safer for him. So everybody they got a hold of said, huh, I'm not into being a sacrificial lamb. Mm, Thank mm. you very much, but no. 
Um, and they did have one person who was going to run. He was the state minority leader, and everybody kind of gotten behind him. And the idea was, uh, he thought he could run even to the right of this guy, which was almost impossible because the guy had a zero liberal rating. So, you know, anyway, on and on it went. So he comes home one night from one of these meetings. Now, this is how desperate they were. And he says to me, guess whose name came up? And I said, I don't know. He said, yours. I said, mine? I haven't run for a bus. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, 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 what do you mean? And he said, no, 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 you'll never win. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so important. And he said, you're always telling those young students they ought to get out there. You really ought to get out there. Well, it was amazing because it all happened really fast. My parents happened to be on one of those people to people tours to Thailand. And when my mother comes back to Denver, somebody says, did you know your daughter announced for Congress? She literally <laughs> dissolves on the floor. It's like, I can never leave town again. What if she lost her mind? But anyway, the rest is history. And, and so you, and even you thought it would, this would, you wouldn't right. even win the primary. No, so this was no, something you'd be no. doing between May and oh, uh, yeah. September. I never gave up my jobs. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, still. <laughs> so how, that, that first campaign, how, how did you, camp, was it door to door? Were you in shopping centers, mailings? How did, what, was the, what was the technique that you used in that first campaign? Well, think about this. My average campaign contribution was $7.50. Um, it was in the basement. Our campaign headquarters was in the basement. Um, we had a whole group of people that were friends that sat around the dining room table and we called ourselves kitchen table media. So when somebody said, you know, who's doing your media, I'd say kitchen table media. And usually people would say, oh, I've heard of them. You know, I mean, so. <laughs> but I remember PBS came out to film this thing because it was like the rag, and, and they couldn't believe it either. Um, but, you know, we were just having a really good time. Mm -hmm. And we did really stark, radical posters. I brought them back here and showed them to the DCCC. Mm. And they said, did these go out? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, pff, forget about it. We have no money for you. This is crazy. We had, for example, it was the Vietnam War. So we took a picture of the military cemetery with a bird flying over it. And underneath it was a quote from the president saying, yes, many of our troops have already been withdrawn. Yeah, hard hitting, right? Yeah. And again, they were like, oh, you didn't do that. And I said, yeah, we did. We had the Olympics on the ballot. And every single uh, politician said, well, it's wonderful that people can express their opinion, yada, yada, yada. So we had a picture of an elderly woman walking down the streets in Denver with a cane. And under it, it said, cheer up, the Olympics are coming. <laughs> <laughs> which lost me the Chamber of Commerce and some of the labor unions. Um, and, <laughs> and our third poster, because I've always really cared a lot about children, is we took a picture of a migrant child sitting under a crucifix on a dirt floor at about a year old, and it said, this radical troublemaker is out to get something from you. Hope. Well, People loved the posters. It cost us a penny a piece. And, you know, they were all over town. I mean, yeah. we yeah. absolutely, uh, <laughs> we had graffiti all over town, our yeah. posters. Yeah. But, and, and they went on to win a lot of awards. Yeah. But that was not what anybody wanted. I mean, in Denver, all the politicians' stuff looked the same. You know, you have the picture of the family, and you have the picture of the, uh, with a policeman to show you're for the law and order, and maybe one in the grocery store to show that you're a consumer. And then the only way you could tell if it was a Republican or a Democrat was the last one, where if it was a Republican, they were on a horse, and if it was a Democrat, they were on a bike. And other than that, you didn't know. I mean, that was it, you know. So this was all so radical. Right. Um, right. Nobody could believe it, and I just yeah. think, I, I don't have any idea. Well, first of all, I knew a lot of labor guys. Oh, okay. So my husband would talk about driving downtown and some guy would lean out the window and he'd have a Nixon Schroeder button. Uh, and he'd say, oh my God. <laughs> or <laughs> some of the construction trades had a thing saying hard hats for a soft broad, which was not, I said, no, those have to go. I mean, so I, I don't know. It was crazy. <laughs> but, but you also have said your opponent ignored you. I guess oh, he did. He called me Little Patsy, and yeah, I was yeah. a head taller than he was. Yeah. 
Um, and, and he had wonderful, he had some wonderful young women that he dressed up in all alike, and they were Mike's girls. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I mean, can you believe that this was going on in the 70s? Yeah. And it was fabulous. Did, did, did you feel the, the race coming towards you at all towards the end, or was it still a surprise on you the know, election? You know, we never did a poll. Yeah. Uh, and, and I should say, not only in that race, but ever. You've never done no, a poll. No, we've never right. done a poll. Right. Um, well, you know, people were really enthusiastic that were around me, mm -hmm. but oh, yeah. I... I yeah. You know, I mean, he yeah. was an incumbent, and everybody who knew anything in Washington told me there's it no just, way. Okay. And, you know, I had uh, Gloria Stein who came out for me, but I didn't see any other members of Congress show up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, mean, yeah, yeah, the yeah, DCCC yeah, or anyone. Yeah. So I just yeah. figured I was having a really good time saying what I wanted to say. Yeah. So, that, so I've been so doing it ever since. Ever since. It was really nice. <laughs> So uh, a few months after winning your arrive here in Washington, you obviously have to quickly get to work, including um, securing committee assignments, desired committee assignments. Can, can you describe your first impressions here and when you came and talk about the getting, getting on committees? Well, first of all, I came you know, during the, the Vietnam War, so the whole place smelled like tear gas. Mm. There were huge demonstrations. It was the Nixon inaugural. And we would go through the tunnels, and they were full of National Guardsmen uh, mm -hmm. staying in well, there. Um, well. So I was really like, what have I done to my life? And I remember walking into my office, and there were six bags of mail <laughs> all on the bombings and what was going on. So people forget mm -hmm. how that era was. Um, yeah, the whole thing, members of Congress would say to me, are you a fluke? And mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, they couldn't really quite believe yeah. that I had gotten elected. Yeah. And the speaker kept trying to swear in Jim, and he right. kept saying, no, yeah. it's her, right. it's her. <laughs> right. And everywhere I would go and we would have to line up, they would always come and say to me, no, no, you don't understand. The member goes in front of you. And I would say, no, I, I'm the member. Yeah. And, they, and they said, no, 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 I know you're a member of the human race, but, you know, no, 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 I mean, we're, yeah. yeah. And yeah. So, it, but you, you did try to get on armed services, the armed I services did try committee. To get on armed was services. that related to the district or? Well, because I was a pilot and I thought nobody uh, ever talked to women and children about being defended. I felt that everything that I wanted money for, they were going to say, we don't have money for it. Oh, because it's all going into defense. The immense expense is mainly in defense. I won't sing, but you know the deal. Um, so I should be there and I should look at it. And, mm -hmm. and I also felt very strongly about military families. Nobody ever talked about them. They only talked about hardware. So I thought, well, this is a wonderful idea. It's time we have a woman. Uh, that was not exactly what mm. the chairman thought. Right. The chairman was F. Eddie Bear from Nolans, Louisiana, and what we called it was a, a boll weevil back then. And there was also no African Americans on. And uh, uh, Ron Dellums also wanted to get on. So we were both vetoed by the chairman. Uh, and they had never overridden a veto of a chairman before. And they overrode it and put the two of us on. So the two of us walk in the first day and we're thinking we're pretty smart. You know, we're now on the Armed Services Committee. And the chairman is going off about this is the worst thing that ever happened, and this is terrible, and the Congress has now been ruined, and why, blah, 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 blah. But his only power that he has left, he says, is how many chairs are at the dais, and these two people are only worth half of the rest of you, so they get one chair. So we sat cheek to cheek. Um, <laughs> Got to be quite good friends. Right. Uh, and wonderful Barney Frank used to go around introducing me that it was the only half-assed thing that I ever did when I was in Congress. <laughs> but I, okay. I, I think there were many other things okay. that I did that were. But anyway, it was okay. kind of... <laughs> and, and did you, you, I think, ask, did you ask the Congressional Research Service early oh, on? Yeah. How many? How, how, long, how long will it be before there are as many women in the House as Absolutely. men? Absolutely. Yeah. I wanted to know how long before we represented what we were in the population. And they came back with some number around 400. 
years. Yeah. <laughs> which I thought was outrageous. Right, right, right. But you know what? Yeah, but it's true. At the uh, maybe true. You're right. Oh, right, right maybe right. <laughs> right, right, right. Congressional <laughs> Research Service is probably nailing it. I don't right. know. Yeah, yeah. So, let me ask about your initial uh, approach to being a legislator here. Um, apparently, you didn't say to yourself, I'll work my way up the leadership ladder, that'll be the way I become effective. Um, and it also appears that you had an approach early on. You, you knew what you were going to do pretty much from the start. Um, just what was your philosophy of being effective and um, hmm. when did that come to you? Well, several things. Number one, I figured that there was really no welcoming committee out there for me, and there were really no mentors. Mm, um, mm. At that time, half of the women, about half of the women who were in Congress, had taken their husband's seats after they had passed mm. away. And so they had this image, they were carrying on their husband's agenda. And I'm like, okay, yeah, well, what about the women's agenda and all that? Well, we're not into that. You know, that's, that's girly stuff. Um, and the women's movement was coming alive, and I had very strong feelings about mm -hmm. what's happening here. I also had feelings about, okay, um, I can write a, an alternative defense budget the way I would write it. My chairman didn't appreciate that. Uh, but, you know, I just really felt, uh, well, we were told what, the, what you're supposed to do is to be quiet, stay in your seat, keep coming back, and then eventually you get power. And I figured by then I would have forgotten why I came. So, right, you know, right. and I never knew how long I was going to be there anyway, so I may as well make noise while I'm here and have a good time. Right. <laughs> in, in, in your uh, memoir, which has the title 20, 24 Years of Housework and the Place is Still a Mess, um, <laughs> I, you, you said that I always felt that my job, as designed by the Founding Fathers, was to listen to people uh, engage their minds, stir up controversy, and steer clear of sanctimony. Is that Absolutely. pretty much how you handle it? Absolutely. Right. And, and, you know, I, I, you know, there's two ways. I think when you're a politician, you so often know what the applause line is. Right. And the temptation is so out there to just go and do the applause lines. But, for example, then let's say amnesty was a big issue. So people will come in, absolutely, those people that went to Canada, they ought to be shot, you know, whatever. And so then they'd come in and they'd say, you know, there's this really nice kid in our neighborhood, and he went to Canada, could we get him back? <laughs> and I'd say, you know, there isn't any way I can write a law mm. that they're all going to be shot and yet bring him back. And it would be the same with immigration, it would be the same with anything. People had this really hard, you know, no, we don't want divorce for anyone, or no, we don't want amnesty for anyone, or no, we don't want immigration for anyone, except all these nice people that we right. know. And, and, you know, I always felt you ought to be educating people on that right. rather right. than standing up and going for the applause line. Right. Right. So it is the harder way, but I understand, you know, when you do a polling thing, where you're going to go. But if you bring people in, I always have that, I, I guess it's a faith, but I always have the idea that if you explain to them, well, now look, what we're going to do yeah. if we do this, if we take your path, yeah. uh, that, that they begin to understand and they say, yeah, well, maybe we need a little leeway or maybe we need to figure out a way they can work their way back or, you know, right. whatever. Right. One, you, you've had many legislative accomplishments. I thought maybe we could take one of them, one which we're familiar here with in the library, the Family uh, Medical Leave Act. Can you just take us through uh, and describe your strategy for that and how you got it through, even with two uh, presidential vetoes? Mm. What was the mechanics mm. of doing that? Well, I looked at running for president in 1987. Uh, I decided not to. And then I did a Great American Family Tour mm -hmm. because I was trying to get family medical leave going with a wonderful pediatrician from Harvard, uh, Dr. Brazelton, maybe many mm. of you know him, and T. Bear Gary Goldberg, who was uh, the producer of Family Ties, the writer, and his wife, uh, Diana Meehan. And the four of us went off and we went to these primary states and we said to people, 
please write your check saying do not cash this unless you're for family leave or something. Well, we had all the candidates saying they're for family leave, including George H.W. Bush, who I really liked, but I don't think he really got what family leave was about because then we got back and we passed it and he vetoed it, you know, mm -hmm. and then he did it again. Right, right. And luckily, one of the states we had gone to was Arkansas when Clinton was governor. Mm -hmm. And so when Clinton came in, we finally got it passed. But, you know, it's still so watered down and everything else. I thought, well, think of Americans who, when they saw Prince George born in England, and, you know, there were all those articles about how England is a little backward compared to the rest of the European Union. In England, if you have a baby, you only get 52 weeks of job-protected leave, 39 of which are paid. Now, the other countries have a much better one. You know what we've got? I mean, I, I, and I'm almost embarrassed to say that's my bill. Everybody went around saying, isn't this wonderful? We passed this bill. And I'm like, that was 20 some odd years ago. What have you done since? Could you please beef it up? So it's the frustration of seeing how we, I don't think there's a capital in, a, in the world that talks more about family values and does less. Right. And it really, right. it really right. bothers me. So, with, with that legislation, there was some need on your part to compromise. Oh, yeah. And in your experience in the House, um, was, is it more often go for common ground or is it more often compromise? No, thank goodness I compromised that yes. we wouldn't have any family yeah. leave at all. Yeah. I mean, 20 years later, yeah. my dream was we compromise and that they start trying to increase it, right. but at least we have it, yeah. which I yeah. think is, is why you want some compromise. At least you get a start and you find out the world didn't stop. I'll never forget the Chamber of Commerce somewhere down in the South when we were trying to get it said, lady, if you pass loose, the entire South's going to shut down during deer hunting season. Everybody's going to have their babies so they can get six weeks off to go deer hunting. <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> well, Southern women are a lot different than Western women because I don't know anybody who planned their pregnancy around yeah. deer hunting season right. so they can get <laughs> off. I mean, really? Okay. So, this, you know. Another thing just on the legislative process, um, in a uh, 1989 art Newsweek article um, on, the, on the world of Congress, you were quoted as saying, the name of the game here is if you have to explain a vote to a significant group of people, you better not make it. That's exactly that, the right. applause line thing. Is that right? Okay. If you have to yeah. explain yeah. it, you know, it takes too much time. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and to me, that's really what we're supposed to be. Uh, yes, legislators, but also educators. Right, educators right. as to why legislation isn't so easy. Otherwise, we ought to just legislate by poll. You know, we right, can poll right, everyone right. in America and say, what do you want? Uh, yes, no, yeah, yes, mm -hmm, no. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I, I really feel we've lost a lot of that, that right. we've gotten this really, you know. Right, and the, the compromise, there was one incident where you worked with Phyllis Shafley on um, increasing exemptions for dependents. Right. And I think they had the two of you hard. on the front page of the on the front page of the New York Times, and your office got flooded with how could you how could you do I this? I know but, how yeah. could you sell out and even yeah. be in the same room? Right. Uh, you know, a stop clock is right twice a day, and so you know okay. you, yeah. okay. <laughs> you, <laughs> right. you work with who you work with to try and get something done, to get something and done. it's right. terribly important. Right. Okay. You know, one of the things uh, uh, that I, I feel very bad about. One of the things that I worked very hard on and I never got done was safe motherhood. Mm -hmm. um, it's, this is the 100th anniversary of Margaret Sanger having started uh, contraceptive clinics on the basis that that was for preventive health mm -hmm. for women. And here we are 100 years later and the, con and the, uh, led, uh, the Supreme Court still deciding, hmm, is contraception really preventive health? Yeah. Meanwhile, in the last 25 years, according to UNICEF, uh, maternal deaths have doubled in America, mm -hmm. and we are 50th universally, right below Ser Serbia. You know? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And we don't talk about the maternal health issues. I mean, right, right. people in America watched Downton Abbey and watched one of the characters die of preeclampsia, and people would say to me, well, what's that? Do we have that in America? I said, yeah, we got that in America. I know three people who had it. Um, and it's, Oh, really? Do we do any research? No, because our image is everybody's a safe motherhood here. And, and you know, th so those kind of issues, women's issues I found particularly difficult. Family mm. issues, very difficult. And I think it's still that way because I think Congress thinks of itself as the most important and powerful right. uh, legislature and the most important mm -hmm. capital, which is true. And so we only deal with important issues. Right. And that's not family and that's not female. Right, right. right. Um, let me ask you, and you've, you've exhibited this just in this brief discussion too, you, you had a, um, a reputation for an imaginative and um, sometimes biting whip, uh, wit. Um, no. <laughs> some, uh, referring to President Reagan, I, I think it was on the House floor, you said, I was cooking breakfast this morning for my kids, and I thought, he's just like a Teflon frying pan. Nothing sticks to him. That's right. Um, I, I, you've probably have repeated many times to uh, questions we could guess. I have a brain and a uterus, and I use both. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> President President George H. W. Bush had the coattails of a bikini. I think you mentioned in the, after the '88 election. Actually, and, it was McGovern. I was had McGovern. The, okay. Had the, and then, had, and was wearing a bikini. To. Um, to to uh, some of your Pentagon, member Pentagon allies on the House Armed Services Committee, if you guys were women, you'd always be pregnant. You just can't say no. Um, now, I, I think um, you, you, you obviously use these to, uh, to, great, to effect. What was, your, what, what was the strategy behind these one or two liners? I mean, you, you weren't yeah. um, just standing up to get laughs. Um, they were well, effective in a lot of ways. I, you know, I always figured my words should be tender and juicy because I often had to eat them. But okay. <laughs> uh, um, basically, one of the real problems I always had in Congress was I felt that we became so wonkish. We wanted to throw 50 pages at everything in, in a society that's it's America, and if you weren't born with attention deficit disorder, we teach mm -hmm. it to you within the first year of your life. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to have a word picture that kind of captures where, you know, right, right. What, what you're saying. The other part is, I must say, part of it was I really suffer fools lightly, uh, mm. or, or not very well. And so, you know, when the 85th person says to me, how can you be a congresswoman and a mother? You kind of say, a, a brain, a uterus, uterus, they both work. What else okay. do you want to know? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. you just get very impatient with that yeah. kind of, of craziness right. that, right. that okay. women tend to get asked. And I doubt that there's ever been a male asked, how can you be a father and yeah. a member of Congress? Congress. Right. You know. right, okay. Um, but just your district, can you just briefly describe what your district was like and how much time were you devoting to the national issues versus the district. What did people in the district um, expect of you and ask of you uh, most? I had a wonderful district. Denver is one of the most uh, educated cities, young. Um, and the wonderful thing about Colorado is so many people moved in, like myself, mm, anywhere mm, else I would mm. have been a carpetbagger. Right, right, right. Uh, because they wanted to live a better life or they wanted to make mm, things mm. better. And so when we, for example, had tremendous pollution, people were like, fix it, fix it. Okay, well, we're going to have to do this. We're not going to have fireplaces, you know, burned. You're not going to do this. Fine, terrific. Is there anything else we can do? <laughs> you know, they, they didn't fight it. We had an awful lot of oil and mm -hmm. gas mm -hmm. people. We had a lot of uh, environmental yeah. people. <laughs> My hardest part was I've never been a sports addict. You know, I grew up when girls basketball was you could dribble twice and not cross the center line. It didn't look like a sport to me. Yeah. Um, and so I had the unique thing of having one district that had four National League teams. Mm -hmm. So that was my yeah. hardest yeah. job yeah. was keeping, keeping up, up with, with the, the sports with part. The sports. Yeah. But the rest of it was I, I really found most people were very fair. Now, there were others who, you know, I absolutely drove nuts. 
but we say out west, you know a person by their enemies. And I okay, had a good okay, list, okay. yeah. And, and as you became a national figure, did that help you with your constituents or did they say stop paying attention to that stuff and pay attention no, to Denver? No, because I, you know, I still went back there all the time. Yeah. I think they often wished I'd go somewhere else for a okay. while. You know, okay. it's like, oh okay. my God, there she is talking yeah. again. Now, in, in you mentioned before that in 1987, um, you were a candidate for president. In fact, Time Magazine had you um, in a poll uh, third uh, among the candidates. If I can ask you to be a bit immodest here, wh why were people pushing you to run in that race? What, what, what were they telling you? You have to do this, Pat, because you're blank. Well, they weren't pushing me to run. I started out as Gary Hart's co-chair, our okay. chairman, you know, for the presidency. And uh, <laughs> when all of a sudden monkey business happened, right, right. Uh, I was like, I was furious. I was so furious. And I thought, okay, I've been clearing my calendar and, and going around and representing him and all these things. I'll just do it myself. You know, it's kind of one of those right, right. impassioned moments. Um, but there was a run, Pat, run. There movement. was. Right, I mean, there right. were an awful lot of people who said, yes, that's terrific. Remember, this yeah. is like four years after Ferraro had run. And a lot of us thought, okay, this is great. When Ferraro ran, I was one of them, saying the ticket will never be all male again. We're always going to have diversity. Yeah, I was wrong. Uh, but a lot of us thought that was really going to yeah. happen. And so, you know, I looked at it, and then I realized, well, I had gotten in a little late. Do it. Because you I needed had, to raise a lot of money. For you it. needed yeah. to raise a lot of money, and I had gotten in really too late. I mean, people were all... And secondly, there was still such an attitude. Um, I'll never forget in the South being introduced by uh, a chairman of the Democratic Party saying, I like this woman. is a fine woman. This woman knows more about the, the military than all those other candidates together, and I don't have any trouble... Uh, with a woman being president, and I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe I should rethink this. This is the South. And then he said, however, I just can't imagine having a man for first lady. And I'm like, <laughs> I think I'm going to go shoot myself. And then you've got to get up and give a speech. And, and the, the crazy question I kept getting all the time then is, why was I running as a woman? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and... Right. I, you would say, I, I, I don't know what the other options were, and I don't know when I was given them. I missed that. But, uh, so I really realized that there were whole parts of the country that had never elected a woman to anything. Right, right. And I was such a novelty act mm, that I mm. couldn't overcome that. Right. You know, and I just read a poll, maybe some of you saw it recently, where 11% of Americans still say that they couldn't vote for a woman for president mm. today. Mm. Mm. And that 23% say they think men are better p suited to politics. Right. So, right. you know, it's we've still clear. got those right. attitudes out there. Um, it's always hard because most of us don't know those people. I don't know where they're living, right. but they're answering <laughs> yeah, polls. Right. So, you right. know. <laughs> and it's in the 94 election, the House turned, the majority switched to the Republicans. You did not run in 96. Um, mm -mm. What was the difference in 20, you know, being in the majority for 22 years and then boom, uh, literally overnight, you're in the minority? It was awful. Um, you know, it is a hard job if you do it right. You know, right, right. at least, you know, you're commuting 2,000 miles every weekend and, and you're traveling around and doing all sorts of things. And the thing that, that makes it worthwhile doing is that you get something to the outbox. It may take right, a long right, time, right. but something finally gets to the outbox and you say, okay, we got family leave, or okay, we got the Women's Health Initiative, or okay, we got, you know, whatever. Um, it became very clear to me that what I felt like all of a sudden was I got up every morning, I got dressed, I came down here, and it was like being in a junior high lunchroom. All I did was be in a food fight all day, you know, with everybody, rah, rah, rah. and then you go home, and you think, nothing is going into the outbox, and, and it really wasn't. And I was also the co-chair 
of the Women's Caucus. The Women's Caucus had been the largest bipartisan caucus on the Hill. We had both men and women, mm -hmm. both parties. Um, and it kind of got totally uprooted. They said, no, it's got to move up the hill. You got to have outside sponsors. You can't do it. So it really gutted it. And I thought, well, I don't know how we're going to get any of this stuff done. And do I really, you know, I was then 55. There's a lot of ageism in this society, especially against women. And I thought, if I don't leave now, I'll have to be here till they take me out horizontally yeah. or something. Yeah. And I wasn't sure the place was big enough for yeah. both me and Gingrich. Yeah, right. So, you yeah. know, there okay. we were. Okay. Um, do, you, do you follow congressional deliberations today? Do you flip on C-SPAN and say, let me see how these folks are doing? And Rarely, really? because yeah. I really find, yeah. you know, when I came, it's changed a lot. And I don't want to sound like a crabby old lady saying, well, they're not like they used to be. But when I came, we had some really intense debates about the Vietnam War. I mean, there were people who were for it and people who were against it. And we would argue about why we thought it was a bad idea or why we thought it was a good idea, whatever. And then we'd go to coffee. That doesn't happen. You know, right, now right, it's no, more right, name calling right, and right. you wouldn't be near them because it's like mm -hmm. some of their terribleness might wipe off on you. Right. Or we, we were having very strong, I mean, we had impeachment coming on, for right, heaven's sakes. Right. Impeachment of a president. So you can imagine how tense that was. But again, you could have those things and then you would go see them or you would walk out and you'd still be friends. It would be more like a courtroom thing that I was right, used to. Right. And all of a sudden it became this incredible polarized. And so I don't really find the debates that informant it, anymore. Right, right. I find them much more accusing people of being either Neanderthals or socialists or this or that, you know. And so the one thing I know is that when you're flinging labels around, you're not arguing, you're not debating, you're just flinging labels around and hoping they stick. <laughs> do, do you, could, a, could a Pat Schroeder come along today and effectively use the same approach that you did when you came in? You know, I, I used to think it couldn't happen, and I must say how pleased I was to see, uh, and I'm sure there are many others too, but let's just take Elizabeth Warren who ran for the Senate. 80% of her money was $50 or less. So if we as Americans really want to get mad about this, we could do it. I mean, 80% of her money, $50 or less. That's, and she raised more money than anybody right, running for right, Senate last right, time. Yeah, yeah. And I think she's been very outspoken uh, against a lot of special interests, which is terrific, which many people would tell you, oh, you don't want to do that because they give you money, yada, yada, yada. So I always say, that, excuse me, I, I'm going to be sexist. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Women are really a, a, a hidden potential. You know, we're moving towards the 100th anniversary of women having the right to vote. If every woman in this country wrote a check for what they spent for their last outfit to a candidate that they thought was really good, we could really make some noise and change right. things. Right. Okay. But uh, my, my feeling was always there's two kinds of people. There's the kind of people who wring their hands and moan about how bad it is, and the kind of people who roll up their shirt sleeves and say, damn it, I'm going to fix this, you know. And we yeah. got to change our attitude because right. I think we're getting much too imbued in the cynicism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it will never work, and oh, I can't put out that kind of money, so why should I write a check to anybody, and oh, they're all rotten. And that's very dangerous if that keeps spreading, and it's spreading very fast. Um, after the, the House, you became the president and CEO of the Association of American Publishers. I mentioned to you when, before we started here that we could have three days of talks on, on that. Um, you're now living in Florida. Um, and Happiest I, place on earth. Right, okay. <laughs> Good. And you're on the board of directors of the League of Women Voters of Florida, so you, you're still dabbling selectively in in the um, right. political arena. You're also teaching at, at uh, Rollins College in uh, Winter Park. And I'm also on the Common Cause National Board. Mm -hmm. Poor old John Gardner, you know. He's such a wonderful man. And I'm sure he looks up, uh, down, I'm sorry, from heaven and says, oh my gosh, you know, the issues yeah. are still there. Right, right, right. 
Mm. You, would you mind if we had a few questions from the audience? No, I okay. love it. Okay. If somebody, are you raising your hand? Okay, good. We have mics that we'll hand out to folks. Is one of the pieces of legislation that I think is is one of the most amazing constructions I saw and and a problem solving kind of thing that was interesting because it involves such a broad span politically of people was the the uh, DOD child care thing that came out of House Armed Services in 87 or 88 and my impression was it was the work of the five women who were then on the committee and they ran the political gamut from you well to the to the right, two Republicans. Uh, if it was just a thousand eaches and there's no way to simplify it, just wave me off. But was is there a short way to tell the story of just mechanically? How did you do that? Oh, well, it's very easy and you'll understand it in today's parlance. First of all, most of the members only cared about the hardware. And, you know, I used to go to meetings and they'd say, well, are we going to vote for F-15s or not? Well, how many tickets did they buy to your fundraiser, you know? I mean, really, that type of stuff. Um, and and the, the family stuff, while they always talked about it, they never did much. And so we just kind of did it. And they really didn't pay much attention to it. It was like, oh, you really think this is needed? Now, we also had some wonderful generals and admirals and people tell us that how terribly important this was, that this was a mission issue, that you had more and more married couples that were both working, and if the balloon ever went up, if they didn't have some daycare for the children, what was going to happen? You know, you may not be able to get to your mission. So um, that helped too. But there were a lot of pieces of it that just all came together. And then the best part that we stuck in there was the pay equity issue, so that the child care workers are some of the highest paid child care workers in America. I mean, there's something wrong with the society that pays its child care workers the least. And we pay usually less than what we pay people who take care of dogs. So uh, that was a very good thing, too, and that just brought the whole thing up. Anyone else? No questions. Really? This is oh, okay. amazing. Yeah, go okay, ahead, go ahead. Right here. Yeah, we hit up some mic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way to uh, incorporate like a, a civics education component into our schools that would be helpful at this point, and if there's also like a maybe a media literacy component that can uh, help us with <laughs> battling the 24-hour news cycle. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Oh man. Well. I have I, the um, the civic literacy. Unfortunately, we've got so many states teaching to the test, and if it's not on the test, they don't teach it. And it really is tragic that we don't know. Thank goodness for the library. I'm glad you're doing the Magna Carta, and I'm glad that all the things that are coming. Hopefully, maybe we will learn something. But I think all of us have met new citizens who embarrass us because they know more about how our government works than how we do. So, yes, we do desperately need a, cit a citizen's... Re re maybe Remember the little song, Bill on the Hill? And they don't do that anymore in the cartoon hour, and they should, because kids don't even know how the bill gets through the hill, you know, which was, which was great. <sighs> how I wish. Well, a lot of people are talking about it, but I, I still don't see much movement. Um, the second part of your question, I'm old and I've now forgotten, which was... Uh, uh, just about media literacy. Oh, media leader. Oh, God, yes. Okay. You know, but one of the things, when I got elected, one of the things that really helped me, it was back in the old days, way before you were born, when we believed that the public airways were public, and therefore, the people who had a license to use them had certain responsibilities. And one of it was the Fairness Doctrine. If you had one side on, you should have the other side. So you can imagine a 32-year-old with two children, there was constantly somebody going, rah, 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 you know. And so we would go and ask for equal time, and I could sit there and say, well, here I am, and yes, I have two kids, and, you know, this is what I believe in, and so forth and so on. And people say, oh, 
Well, she's not swinging on a rope and eating bananas like that other people, or, or the other person said. And that kind of saved me. Uh, when Reagan came in, he did away with that with a stroke of the pen. And so now you can attack people 24 7 and they can't even get on, even though they are public airways. And secondly, you can't even buy time if they don't want to let you on. So that is a terrible problem. And there's still a lot of people who believe if they hear it on the radio or hear it on TV, it must be right. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not so. So uh, media savvy is tough. And I'll tell you, the other thing I worry about so much is the newspapers. We're losing the journalistic newspapers that we had. And if you go back and look at Jefferson, he always said that a, a strong independent press was very critical for a democracy. So maybe young people like you can figure out what's going to replace that or what's going to come up because we desperately need it at the moment. We either get stuff fed to us directly by the candidate and every candidate is for godmotherhood, sunshine, you know, little puppies, whatever. Uh, so, you know, you read it all and you have no idea. I mean, what's the difference between candidate A and candidate B? They're all for godmotherhood, uh, little puppies and kids or whatever. Um, the media is either all on one side or all on the other and such an, so often and and the newspapers have just kind of disintegrated in many places so you don't have any independent investigation. Um, and that's, that's pretty frightening. If I can define myself and nobody ever looks into what I'm doing, oh my goodness, I'm going to be the best person you ever heard of. Mm. And that shouldn't be. Anyone else? One more question? Right here, right in the middle. Maybe we can get you a mic. Hypothet hypothetical, you're elected president tomorrow. What are your five priorities? <laughs> five priorities, okay. I'm terribly, terribly concerned about the incredible pay disruption, or uh, the pay inequity. Um, hallelujah for Seattle and $15 an hour. Two-thirds of, uh, of the minimum wage workers are women. The lowest paid workers in America are single women with children. Do you think that child poverty might be derivative of that? So those things all, I think, are terribly important. I think it's terribly important to get education back on keel. Um, we're, we're so uh, missing, uh, uh, missing out. When I was with the publishers, I really learned that. I mean, you go to India, we may have MIT. You want to know how many MIT equivalents they've got? And China, and you know, they're out there. And a generation from now, we're going we're gonna to really start seeing tremendous problems with this if we don't get focused on it. And if you look at most of our universities, if you want math and science, guess what? It's going to be a foreign student teaching it. I mean, really? Don't we have anybody left in America that can teach math and science in America? We, it's it's a tr tremendous neglect there. Those, those would be two very key things. Three, I am obsessed about burden sharing. Totally obsessed about burden sharing. When Eisenhower created NATO, he said, if we've still got troops in Europe 10 years from now, we have failed. Hello? You want that? We got 120 countries we got troops in. What are we thinking? And, and, you know, there was a wonderful cartoon in the UK paper where these people are coming out of their house, the next door house is in fire, and they said, when are the Americans going to come and fix this? You know, I mean, <laughs> I, look, I am more than willing to do our part, but our part's not 99.9%. .9%. And I, uh, you know, I, I used to rant and rave about this all the time, and, and if you put the European countries together, they have more people than we do and they have a higher GDP if you put them all together in the European Union. And what do they do when we have anything? I mean, the Belgians sends chocolates and someone else sends bikes and someone else sends some films. It's like, come on, people, and now we have a united front. Baloney! I mean, they, somebody has really got to say it is grow-up time. Uh, these things are in your backyard. I mean, I, I look at the Ukraine, 
It's like, it's pretty close to you. Serbia and all of that was kind of close to them, and yet we keep coming in. So I would be Madam Burden chairing, and they would hate it. They used to, I used to get thrown out of a lot of NATO meetings because it was like the skunk at the garden party. It's like, no, no, no. And our eyeguards are like, no, 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 this is what we do. We're America. You know, we're here. We're here to save you, you know, the cavalry. Um, <laughs> the environment. I realize most human beings can't think beyond two generations, but now we're getting to the point where we're pushing it so hard we may even be able to impact <laughs> both those generations. We really need to be more thoughtful about that. Um, and I, I, I salute the president for trying to take it on. And of course, the coal states will scream bloody murder and everybody else will scream bloody murder and you may have to pay another penny if you have to use natural gas versus in coal. And, but isn't it nice? Yeah, an overfishing of the, the seas and everything else. We've really got to think about that. I mean, the Native Americans had it right. We don't own this. We, we're, we're kind of borrowing it for a while and turning it over. So that would be one. And finally, of course, I, uh, diversity and all of that, I think is terribly important in our background. But I am so depressed about the fact that women have still not come up to the level that they should. And, and, uh, and we have not dealt with families very equally. And I think what's going to happen is more and more people are going to decide not to have a family. So I, I think women and, uh, women's and family issues, and they shouldn't be women's issues. They, in every other country, they're considered both men and women's issues. In this country, they're on the women's pages. You know, it's, it's what do the women want now? Daycare. Well, you know, men want daycare too. And, and men want, and, and we've got to bring that whole family thing together. We've got to redefine family is wherever you go at night and they let you in. And then we got to figure out, you know, how we, how we, because those are the basic building blocks of this society. And you put those building blocks together and then you put the society on it. Well, if they're crumbling, we're crumbling. So, I mean, those would be my five. Okay. And I don't think I'll get elected on that platform. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just wrap up. Yeah. Um, I want to... I want to thank you again for coming to the Library of Congress today. Uh, we appreciate you talk, talking to us about your life and your career. I think we can learn uh, something from your own experiences. Um, and I just want to close, uh, again, I'm going to um, cite your husband. With, I just want to close with a, um, <laughs> this one will be a little different tone. Um, his, his memoir was called Confessions of a Political Spouse, which was published in 2009. And in there, he, he told this one story about his wife. Um, he said, I can't remember why now, but at some point many years ago, I needed to get something out of my wife's purse. V very dangerous. <laughs> Snug down at the bottom among the hairpins, pens, and Kleenex tissues were several business cards held together with a paper clip. The one on top was for Joe the Balloon Man. One of, one of Pat's favorite things was to order up balloons for our children's birthdays, especially embarrassing them when they got older and the deliveries took place at college or at work. <laughs> on, the, on the back of the card was Shimon Perez's private direct line phone number <laughs> written in his own hand. A small thing a calling card with two important phone numbers said a great deal about Pat Schroeder. <laughs> a sense of humor, fun, and the importance of family keep Joe's card handy. <laughs> a desire to work for peace and justice in the Middle East keep Shimon's number available. Tender and tough, Pat Schroeder. Thank you again, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to you both. Um, uh, Ms. Schroeder, thank you so much for the plug for the Magna Carta. That's a <laughs> great segue into uh, uh, just reminding everyone on November 6th, we'll be opening a major exhibit, 800 years 
uh, 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. Uh, we're bringing over one of the 1215 Magna Cartas and showing 60 treasures from our collections here at the library. And our next law library program will be July 8th, um, a Magna Carta theme, Trial by Jury, Magna Carta and Influence in Criminal Law and Legal Representation at 1 o'clock. So we hope you'll join us then. We have a couple of law library staff at the back with um, iPads that will be taking a survey. We're always trying to improve our programs and look for new topics. Um, thank you both again, and um, thanks to you all for coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.